Good evening, everyone. My name is Deborah Thomas, and I'm the R. Jean Brownlee Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography at the University of Pennsylvania. I couldn't be more thrilled to welcome you on International Women's Day to the screening of the film Madame Sarah, which will be followed by a discussion with the director, Etan Dupin, editor Louise Serrin and Professor Régis Michel Jean Charles. This discussion will be moderated by our own Elisa Jordan, to whom I will turn things over in just a minute. By way of explaining why it is so important to us to be able to share this wonderful film with you tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about our center and what we do. The Center for Experimental Ethnography was founded in 2018 to promote multimodal research practices as both method and theory, integral dimensions of scholarly research. We are a group of faculty across eight of Penn's 12 schools who work through the media of film, performance, creative writing, sound, installation, photography, and beyond. We coordinate scholarship, research, and public partnerships related to multimodal work practices. We consolidate those activities in which we and our students are already engaged. And we grow these generative connections by hosting, visiting scholars, coordinating workshops and conferences, and screenings like this one tonight, supporting multimodal project-based courses, facilitating visual, sonic, and performative research by our undergraduate and graduate students, producing rigorous criteria for evaluating and assessing these projects, and engaging with arts and community-based organizations throughout Philadelphia and forging connections with like-minded institutions worldwide. We believe that multimodal research practices transform how we conduct research, how we generate and disseminate knowledge, how we train students, and how we remain accountable to the communities in which we interact and through which our research circulates. Seeing creative practice as intellectual work necessarily historicizes the inequalities that pervade our society and also generates interventions through collaborative and participatory work. A basic premise that underlies our efforts is the contention that an expanded and multimodal definition of what counts as scholarship will help lead to a more diverse university community, a community in which artistic practice is a cornerstone, not only for engaged and participatory democracy and social justice, but also for the reimagining and transformation of the university as a whole. In focusing on the lives of Haitian women who, as Régine Jean Charles wrote in a review of the film for Ms. Magazine, are both ordinary and extraordinary, Madame Sarra turns our attention to problems of governance, structural violence, and international intervention, and makes us think about these issues not only in relation to Haiti, but throughout the Global South. To focus on these women is also to privilege strategies of survival and collective well being that emerge outside of neoliberal mandates and to move beyond simplistic representation of Haitian realities that often circulate globally. I am so thankful that Alisa was able to organize this screening of Madame Saha. And before I turn things over to her, I also want to thank our co sponsors the Departments of Africana Studies and Anthropology, and the programs in Latin American and Latinx Studies and Gender Sexuality and Women's Studies. I also want to thank Grace Ndishu, our Community Outreach and Administrative Fellow, and of course, Elisa and our IT partners at Media Services, and especially Chris Passanante for making all of this possible. All right, let me take a minute to introduce Elisa Jordan. She is a multimodal cultural anthropologist who received her PhD from the University of Florida in 2016. Her research focuses on questions of bodily being, bodily security, and creativity across field sites in rural Haiti, Ghana, and in social spaces in virtual and augmented reality. 
Elisa investigates these questions using methods of experimental writing, collaborative nonlinear filmmaking, sensory mapping, photography, museum exhibition, and digital experimentations. She's currently researching women's experiences of birthing as care and as resistance in the context of hospitals that imprison mothers, infants, and other patients for debt. And in fact, you can hear her talk more about this work with her collaborator, Carmel Moise, who is a midwife and board member of the organization Mama Baby Haiti uh, at our next third Thursday event, which will take place March 18th at noon. And you can find out more information if you're interested on our website um, at www.cee.org. Uh, I would re be remiss not to also mention that Elisa has been a phenomenal institution builder, and it's because of her skills, her support, her creativity, and her collaborative willingness that we have been able to grow in the ways that we have over the past three years. So Elisa, I hand the baton over to you. Thank you so much, Deb. Great, so I'm Elisa Jordan, and I'm just so pleased to present to you a temps du peintre feature, Madame Sarah Pouvoir Femme Haitien, or Madame Sarah, The Power of Haitian Women Today on the 8th of March, International Women's Day 2021, uh, in collaboration, of course, with the Madame Sarah team. The screening is going to be followed by a discussion between Etan Dupin, the director of Madame Sarah, Dr. Régine Michel Jean Charles, who's an associate professor of French and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College, and Lunice Serin, the editor of Madame Sarah and a candidate for an MFA at Columbia University. At the discussion, we're also going to be joined by Michel Sinfra, who will offer some translation and summarization. The CE screening of Madame Sarah actually follows more than 10 free public screenings of the film throughout Haiti, including an intensive schedule of four screenings over the past four days, although that number is now changing because I see that there are two Madame Sarah screenings happening right now in Haiti as we're speaking. Those screenings are supported by Madame Midi Soir Production, and there are some future very exciting screenings planned to take place in the very marketplaces where Madame Sarah make lives for themselves in their communities. Nous bien content présenter une projection du film Madame Sarah pour voir femme haïtienne Jodia Wikmas en collaboration avec l'équipe Madame Sarah. Après nous passer film na, n'abchita pour nous parler ensemble avec Etan Toupin, directeur film na, et puis Dr. Régine Michel Jean Charles qui est professeur associé the français à Ketid Africaine à Diaspora Africaine dans Boston College, et puis Luni Seren, éditeur film Madame Sarah, qui se yon candidat pour diplôme met dans Atezai à Columbia University. Et puis tout Michel Sinfa pral joué nous, nan parle sa pour le faire résime en créole. Projection sa, pas première projection, hein? nous voulons reconnaître qu'il y suit plus passe 10 projections publiques à gratis en Haïti. Quatre qui passaient dans quatre jours passés, organisés par Matin Midi Soir Production. OK, et bien, on nous passe le film. Na. Great, let's, without further ado, watch the film and then meet up for a discussion afterwards. Wow, thank you so much for watching with us. This film covers so much territory. I hope you guys enjoyed the screening and I want to let you know that the Q&A has been open. So please start submitting the questions that you have for our panelists. Um, this film is abundant as Dr. Jean uh, Michel Jean Charles has pointed out in her beautiful review of this in Miss Magazine. Now we're going to move on to the discussion portion of our event. So let me introduce our panelists tonight. Etant de Pain is a journalist a filmmaker and an avid community organizer. For more than a decade, he's worked as a producer on documentaries and for international media outlets, including Al Jazeera, Telesur, BBC, CNN, Netflix, PBS, and even Vice. Etat founded an alternative media project in Haiti in order to enable citizen journalists to provide access to information in Haitian Creole that was for and about internally displaced people, aid accountability, and politics. Now moved by the strength of his mother, who I hope we're going to hear more about during our discussion, and the women known as Madame Sarah, who make Haiti's economy run, this is his first personal film. 
et tantôt penser en journaliste, un cinéaste et puis un organisateur. Il y a un travail pour les producteurs de documentaires et les producteurs de programmes Al Jazeera, Telesur, BBC, CNN, Netflix et Vice pour plus de 10 ans. Et tant que c'est fondateur d'un projet de médias alternatifs en Haïti qui permet aux journalistes citoyens d'avoir accès à l'information dans le créole haïtien pour les gens. Et puis, tout le monde déplacé en d'un pays, et puis, information sur aide internationale et puis politique. C'est force maman li et force femme qui relève madame sa yo, femme qui responsable pour l'économie haïtienne qui a marché, qui inspire li pour faire film madame sa ra, et puis, ça c'est fi, premier film personnel li fait. Dr. Regine Michel Jean Charles is a feminist literary scholar and an activist as well, who's been working on issues surrounding rape culture for the past 20 years. She's currently the Associate Professor of French and African and African Diaspora Studies at Boston College. She holds a BA from the University of Pennsylvania, that's right, where she worked in the Department of African Studies, and we're so glad she has come back for the screening. <laughs> and she has her PhD from Harvard University. She's received fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Mays Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. And she's written over 30 publications, aside from regularly weighing in on contemporary issues like hashtag Me Too and the Haitian diaspora in public media outlets, including the Boston Globe. Her first book, Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation in the Francophone Imaginary, which is published through Ohio State University Press, examines theoretical, visual, and literary texts in order to challenge dominant views of sexual violence. Her second academic book is Looking for Other Worlds, Black Feminism, Literary Ethics, and Haitian Fiction. And that's currently under contract with the University of Virginia Press, and we are all very excited to see that come out. Dr. Jean Charles is also an activist and founding board member of A Long Walk Home, which is a nonprofit organization that uses art to educate, inspire, and mobilize young people and end violence against girls and women. Her work with the Boston area includes initiatives with Shatter the Silence, a faith-based initiative to address sexual violence, and AFAB, the Haitian Women's Association of Boston. Dr. Regine Michel Jean Charles, c'est un intellectuel féministe et littéraire, et puis un activiste qui gagne son travail sur problème de culte cadéjac pour plus passer 20 ans. C'est un professeur associé en français et puis étude africaine et diaspora africaine dans Boston College. Il recevra baccalauréat li ici à University of Pennsylvania, quand il était élève en dans le département d'études africaines. Il gagne doctorat sur Harvard University et puis il recevra la bourse université par Ford Foundation, the Mellon Mays Foundation and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Dr. Jean Charles est auteur de plus de 30 publications et puis il connaît des belles commentaires sur les problèmes du moment que le hashtag MeToo et puis diaspora haïtien dans les médias publics que Boston Globe. Premier livre, li, c'est Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation. Ça, c'est co conflit politique de représentation du cas de Jacques dans l'imaginaire francophone. Deuxième livre, li, déjà en bas contract à University of Virginia Press, et puis il est Looking for Other Worlds, ou bien Chercher l'autre le monde, if that's correct, Féministe noire et éthique littéraire là, et fiction haïtienne. Et puis tout, Dr. Jean Charles, c'est un activiste et puis fondateur à mon conseil de A Long Walk Home, y a un ONG qui utilise l'art, qui utilise l'art pour éduquer, inspirer, à mobiliser demoiselles yo pour suspendre violence contre les filles femmes. Et puis tout, il travaille dans Boston à Shatter the Silence, une initiative qui répond à la violence sexuelle là, et puis AFAB, Association des Femmes Haïtiennes de Boston. And then we have Lunice Serin, who is a Haitian filmmaker with over seven years of experience creating both narrative and lifestyle content. She began her career as a content producer at the LA-based web platform, Black and Sexy TV, where she worked as a series writer, producer, director, and self-taught editor for six years. And self-teaching editing is no small task. So I salute that. 
Most recently, she has worked as the editor of Sirens Film, the producer of Le Mansel Liniere, funded by the Pew Foundation, and she's also the lead editor of the Madame Sarah film. Lunice Serine is a MFA candidate at Columbia University's Screenwriting and Directing MFA, where she was admitted with the Bridges Larson Foundation Fellowship. Lunice Serine, c'est un cinéaste haïtien, actrice passé sept années, créé contenu narratif, contenu lifestyle. Li commence carrière li, cuyon producteur de contenu a yon platform web qui basé en Los Angeles, qui relay black and sexy TV. Kotel te travay kou yon écriteur, producteur, directeur ak editeur pou six ans. Dernièrement, di kon travay kou editeur de yon film Sirens, producti di le Manselinier, ki fonde par Pew Foundation, et pi kou chef editeur di Madan Sara. Et puis tout, Madame Serine, c'est un candidat pour diplôme maintenant à Columbia University, dans un programme scénariste et directeur, pour te réservoir la Bridges Larson Foundation Fellowship. So, welcome, Etant, Regine, and Lunice. I know you guys have a lot to talk about. Um, I would also like to invite the audience to ask questions in the Q&A section as I had before, and to read questions as they are submitted. Uh, I probably should have paused on each of you in turn, but if I could just have Regine and Etant and Lunice each say hi, that'd be great. And then we'll move on to the first question. Hello. Hi, bonsoir, good evening. Thank you so, so much. It's uh, so exciting to be here, especially in my, in my alma mater, University of Pennsylvania, and always a pleasure to talk about this beautiful, beautiful film. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this project and to share this work with you all. We're super proud of the work we've done. So thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. It's International Women's Day, so I try to not say a lot. <laughs> thank you all so much to, for being here. I guess I'm just going to open with a general question and then we'll be moderating the other questions as they come in. And I feel like it's so special to ask this question today on International Women's Day, but also in the context of the political situation in Haiti as there continues to be more upheaval and especially the sort of violence that has occurred in the rash of kidnappings, et cetera. A question that, that comes is why is it important to make this film now and to make it or to make this film and to make this film now both personally and politically where is this how how why is it important to have it now in the context of everything that's going on um let me see the best way to it i mean first of all um madam sarah haitian women in general they're like on the fault line of they like you know losing they, they are the, the the first uh was uh um, being victims uh, every single day by what's happening in Haiti. And I will answer you by, by, by a recent conversation that I had with Clotid. Um, Clotid recently just, you know, um, received a, um, a loan from a, um, from a, a microfinance institution. And I was talking to her and she was telling me, I can't go get, get the money because right, if I go, right now and you know to buy stuff i i won't be able to like sell it it's it's too risky um i think i think right now more than ever it's it's really really important to like you know shed light and tell the, the this story um especially with all that's happening in haiti and we we heard a lot about you know about protests but we don't hear a lot about what's happening inside the market like there's a multiple market multiple market burning in in the last couple of months in Haiti, but you, they barely mentioned in the news. I think it's more, it's, it's really, really important, not only to like, you know, you know, to, to share, to show the film right now, to make the film right now, but also to have this conversation that we have here right now, to have people like Regine, like people like Tina to like, you know, engage the, um, um, not only the audience, but, you know, people in, in, in Haiti, the people who's making decisions to be able to like, uh, do something because it's 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 a uh, it's the situation is 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 uh, is unbearable. 
Yeah, thank you so much again um, for the question. Um, I think I agree 100% um, with Etan. You know, there's this thing that we like to say, which is that, you know, women's history is everyone's history, right? So when you think about a, a story from with women at the center, it's important for all of us to pay attention to. But the thing that really comes to mind for me is just thinking about this um, in relation to your question is number one, resistance, right? And number two, this idea of narrative, right? So why is Madame Saga important right now? Number one, it amplifies the resistance, right? When you think about the fact that this, this a dominion of capitalism, right? These neoliberal imperatives have, are being actively resisted by the Madame Saga. And that's something that's happening all the time. The fact that Etan and Luniz beautifully show the protest happening. This is not new, right? This has been going on for, for oh, what is it, two years or more now, right? So just amplifying the fact that these protests have been ongoing. This is not something that just jumped up. I mean, they, they finished filming the film. They can talk more about the exact dates, but that this is an ongoing project, right? An ongoing, I would argue, decolonial project that the Haitian people have been entrenched in and involved in. Um, and then, you know, this thing about new narratives, right? We all know uh, Gina Ulysse, who is someone I adore, who, you know, wrote this beautiful book called Why Haiti Needs New Narratives. And I think people actually read that book incorrectly because people love to say, Haiti needs new narratives, Haiti needs new narratives. But what Gina actually says, if you read the book carefully, and if you pay attention to the conclusion, she says that she decided to stop talking. Like the point of the book was not to just say, oh, Haiti needs new narratives. She decided to stop taking an oppositional stance and start taking an affirming one, right? Something that I say as a literary scholar is there are actually lots of narratives. Aitsi has so many new narratives, has narratives that are being born right now, but we're just not paying attention. And so I think that, you know, again, going back to Ulysses' conclusion is that this is oppositional in the sense that you see people resisting, but it's also affirming, right? And that's like what I was trying to capture even in my review, like just, it's just such a beautiful, the, the vision, you know, I didn't even notice the Madame Clotilde sitting next to the, the onions, right? Um, but they're, they're offering this vision, an aversion of Aitzi that is affirming, but that is still calling for that resistance and still amplifying women's voices while doing so and the need for change, quite frankly. Yeah, and and I would just add, I think that um, I think that this this story is timeless. Um, the story of Marasaga's in Haiti and their importance and their role is is timeless. It would it would have been important to tell ten years ago. It will be important to tell ten years from now. Um, what makes it really beautiful that it came out during this particular moment? I think. Uh, the international community or in the US and like universally we're, we're paying a little bit more attention to like the ways that the state has failed us I think in the middle of COVID that's like something that everyone is is a little more in tune to and that's kind of something that's at the heart of this film is the ways that the, the state has neglected these women and how they've showed up and carried the nation on their back anyways and that's something that that is mirrored in a lot of our realities right now and so bringing this piece in in this particular time everyone else can engage it on a on a more specific level but this story it, it it's timeless in my opinion Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it, it does feel like such a, a timeless story. And yet that the extraordinary ordinariness of it, there's that level of the extraordinariness of it too, especially at a moment or how relevant um, and how how critical the this this local level critique of capitalism can be in the context of how urgent it can be too at moments like this. Um, one question we're getting from the audience um, that we just like to hear from Etant and Lunis is how did you guys meet Clotilde and the other Madame Sarah you interview in the film? What was that like building a relationship? Uh, oh, I, I met Clotilde in 2015. Um, I, I used to live um, like two minutes to her, you know, office, which is the market. Um, and I used to go there to buy vegetables and this is how we become friends. And, and I used to get to buy my stuff from her. And then one day I told her about like, you know, my intention of making a documentary and she was like quickly, you know, um, embraced the idea and this is how we become friends. Um, and this is, this is how it was, you know, easy, easier for me to build a relationship with her over the years for, you know, for, and I'm, I'm very, I'm grateful that she, 
trusted me to tell her stories and you can see that we like we're very comfortable um and uh, because we spend a lot of time together so and same thing for my for for madame monique madame monique used to sell vegetables in in uh i mean we, i met clotid and in, 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 in madame monique four years apart uh she used to sell vegetables in my in my in my neighborhood but she had she had her own style she will bring you the vegetables on monday and she will come and pick up the money on on, on thursday or friday I was telling her, no, 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 you can, I can pay you. She was like, no, 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 I have my own, my own system. I was like, oh, okay. And after a couple of weeks and I, I, I told her about the, what I was doing and she was like, oh, that's very interesting. And she invited me to her, to her house. And this is how we become, we became friends. And this is, this is, uh, the rest is history. Yeah, Lunice, uh, I was yeah, wondering, I, what, what, oh, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was just saying that I came on board to the film after it was shot. So unfortunately, I actually haven't met either of these women. I was hoping to have been able to do so, you know, when, when the film came out and, you know, everybody would come together, but COVID has not allowed that, so. <laughs> But it was so beautifully edited together. So then my, my follow-up question would be, how did you think through constructing the, that relationship on film with the pieces you were working with into introducing viewers to, to these characters? What was that process like? Yeah, um, it, was, it was a very interesting process. You know, Itzan had, Itzan had a, a, a strong mind of what he wanted to do with the film. And I, it, you know, when he first approached me about working on the project, he, he had such a, a specific vision, you know, he said, I want to honor my mom, I want to honor these women in the mashi, and I want to, I don't want to show it to them, and I want to show people what they've been up to. Um, and so like the main thing for me was that we really wanted to make sure that their voices were at the forefront, you know, every, every topic that we go into in this piece is forefronted with the Manasaga's perspective and then boosted by specialists, but never, never are they, are they in the background. Um, and then just kind of like, I, I was learning so much as we were creating the project, as I was editing everything, I had more questions. I was like, it's, I don't understand this. We need to get this interview or we need to get that interview so that we can fill in these gaps. And it was, it became a very collaborative process because he was super open to all of my feedback and, um, yeah, that's how we were able to kind of, when, when we first started working on it, we were like, this is going to be a small thing, maybe 20 minutes long, but we ended up adding so many more uh, interviews that it, you know, it, it's grown and it's still growing, um, but it's just like, it's such a, a rich, a rich culture, a rich history, a rich part of our reality that is so under, it's just so underexplored that like the more we dug, the more we wanted to add to it. Um, and so it's been a very organic process for us. If I could just ask, because I have this question too, and I that's what I understood as part of the question. Lunise and Etan, how did you get connected? Uh, well, okay, Etan is a longtime contributor to Woy magazine and collaborator with the people over there. My sister, Natalie, um, is the editor at Woy. And, you know, I've been working in film for a while and Itza has been working on this project for many years now and she connected us. She was like, Itza, you need to reach out to Tina or Nunez, whatever my name is on the given day. Um, and, <laughs> and the <you> Haitian know, <laughs> way. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, we, you know, we were able to get into, into in touch. I was, I, I moved to Haiti for a year before I went to grad school. And during that, that year, we were able to kind of, you know, start working on the project and get a, a good bulk of it done while I was still living in Haiti for, for a year. And if people don't know Woy Magazine, it is absolutely amazing. Great resource. So another question we have that we can address to everyone is what what do you think you three think about the kind of action that could be taken or that people would want to be taken in order to address the the insecurity or the protection of the Madansara community in Haiti. 
in many ways, I see the film as envisioning um, there's so much of a future under there's there's this future insinuated in what the women are talking about and in their daily actions of creating these alternatives to these capitalist modes of experience. So I'm just wondering when their comments become more direct about the sort of insecurity they face, specifically this questioner is asking for people in the diaspora what can be done. So I, you know, I'll just jump in, but because I think that for me, someone, you know, as a feminist, as someone that, you know, works with survivors and does works with youth and um, really believes that the people who are at the center of the struggle need to define it, right? Need to say what, what, so what I love about this film too, is that the Mara Saga talk about that. Like there's specific places where they say, we need this, we need this, right? So I would say that I don't have the answer to that, um, but that I think that the first step would be to put the Madame Saga and pose that question to them and say, what do you need? How do you identify, what will make you feel safe? What will make you feel, you know, that you're not in harm's way, which I think is kind of like the organizing perspective to take on it um, that would put them at the center. So have them define those needs for them for themselves and come up with those solutions. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I just want to add, uh, we need, I mean, we need to take the debate to, you know, to um, some specific people in Haiti, uh, especially Haitian men um, who uh, most, I mean, you can see they are the one at the protests in the streets burning the tires. Um, we need to, you know, we need to face that reality. We need to face, uh, um, we can't, we can't keep on, on destroying, 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 like, we, the, all these business women, they are trying to build something every single day. They're trying to build something. And with uh, fire every month or every week or every, you know, two months, it's, 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 it's completely dis dis destructive. And we, this is something that we must face as a, as a society, as, as, as men in Haiti. And uh, I think this is one of the steps that needs to be, that we need to take to address while we're addressing the, 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 the issue. But what I'm hoping to do is, is, Right now, we're having uh, debates everywhere in Haiti um, with the film. With the film, we 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 hope to have a, um, to have a you know a couple of months from there to have something that we can use as a as a as as a proposition as a as a that uh, local authorities can can use that came out of all these discussions um, that. Uh, that can give them an idea about like what exactly that matters are demanding. So because all these debates, they are from like, you know, some, we have some expert, but also we are, we have matters are, we, we, we are debating um, um, with us that participating, participating actively. So I think, I think uh, today, like, 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 uh, like uh, Tina mentioned in, in a while ago, like the, the film is timeless, but at the same time, like there are things that we need to resolve because that cannot be continued, uh, um, you know, um, two years from now, 10 years from now. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think, I think one of the main things that needs to happen and, and that this film tries to, to begin, and then I'm not in any way suggesting that we've solved anything with this film, but is just the, the valuing of the Manasara, because I think part of it is this, this real, real system of neglect and this real system of kind of like oh you know the mara saga and then you put a lot of value and and interest in the exporting and the the bigger business people without realizing that the very real fundamental level that that this level of the economy plays in running this country and i think until we really realize and stop and say we're not going anywhere until we realize that these women are actually the ones that we need to invest in. Um, and so that's like a really huge part of the problem, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, from the top to bottom overhaul that Haiti really needs in its policies and the ways that it deals with, you know, its citizens in general um, to change the reality. Thank you for that. I, I guess a follow up question I would have on that same vein is about the screenings that you guys have been hosting in Haiti right now. What are the kinds of you guys have been really diligent about making space and time to have discussions after the screenings and I'm just really curious about the sort of discussion that's going on and whether or not these these questions are, are getting raised in different ways or if there are different commentaries from Madame Sarah who might be coming to view the film, for example. 
the film is, is is a good tool for for discussion and i think we can do something bigger with it and that this is what we're actually doing um we're having a lot of many screenings and a lot of debates and uh and we're hoping to have people engage and it's not for me to like you know offer my solution and what i you know what i think is supposed to happen like raging machine like it's it's the man it's the people who's actually um you know living living it doing it every single day to to um to demand change to make changes happen um i think uh, what we're doing is to make the film available to you know works with like you know dozens of organizations and haiti was actually doing the work because uh, we're not it's not it's not us that it's not me that uh, in charge of all these screenings uh, it's it's like a local organization in haiti and uh we're hoping to have to have more engagement because we know for sure, like when people engage, big things happen. When people actually um, demand changes, you know, things will change. And I think, uh, um, you know, we put we make the film available, and and uh, I think, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months from now, maybe a year from now, we'll see we we will see some results. I hope. And we have a question from Cynthia who says, thank you so much for this important film and conversation centering women that have historically been placed in the margins. What surprised you in making and watching the film after it was made? Uh, me? I'm opening that to, to all of you because you've all watched the film, certainly. <laughs> Regine did not participate in making it, but I feel like she might have some interesting comments on what she I, was surprised about. Oh, I was, I mean, I, first of all, I found out like Tina was really, really good. She did a, a good job. <laughs> uh, no, this is a good moment to send a, to, to send a shout out to Tina who did a good job. She's not just the, the, the um, editor, she's the story producer also in the film that helping me shape the story. Same thing for Wesley Lene, who's our executive producer, but we work together. Same thing for my partner, who's also an executive produ producer, um, Natalie Miller. Um, I, I, for me, it's it's I doing making the film. What I learned over the years working mostly with international media is not to do when I'm do when I'm when I'm making certain projects. And in Madasada, this is exactly what I did. Um, during the process of making the film. I was patient and I focused on what my, my, what Monique and Clotilde wanted to tell the world about, about Manasa. So it, it, I had a lot of ideas. I have a lot of things that I wanted to do, but I feel like, I think um, I, 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 I realized like they know what they're doing and they know what they wanted to share. And I think I was just, you know, fortunate me and, and Tina and others to like put the story together and sharing, sharing, sharing it with all of you today. So this is what I look. I, I I think like uh, like uh, Dominique said in the film. Maybe they not they don't have a MBA. Maybe they don't have masters, but they know what they're doing. Um, after watching the film, after putting together, I I what I what I realized is like it's it's way Madasa is way bigger than what I had in mind when I started to make the to make the film. And um, I mean I I. I don't know how surprised I was. Or oh, one, my favorite tidbit or my favorite factoid that I learned while making this project was that that the Marasa tradition kind of came from slavery, um, and you know how or why women were were used mostly to go to the marketplace, um, and that that legacy is continuing on. I found very interesting, but also in just conversations about Marasa, realizing how many Marasa were in my family and how like. How, how I'm just, I'm not here and I don't exist without Manasara, um, which is something that's so easy to forget. Uh, but I'm, like my, my, grand, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my great aunts were all Manasara. Um, and so this, this project was so humbling and just such an honor to, to um, honor these women who have been shaping our lives, whether we've acknowledged it or not this entire time. Yeah, me too, Luniz, you know, I think for me, it was just this idea of seeing, you know, it is so beautiful, Madame Sarah is all of us, right, that Madame Sarah is the history of Haiti, so what does it mean to look at, but not just the national narrative, right, like, histoire, you know, with a big H, but also our own personal histoire, 
through the lens of a Madan Saga because we all have that, right? And that was really beautiful for me. And I think um, what was surprising, I well, two things. So I loved how, I, I when I first watched it, I found the ending curious, right? How it ends with, you know, this the sun. And I was like, why are we talking about the sun now? Like, what's going on? But then when I when I interviewed Eta and I realized like, oh, like this is you, right? Like this is, you know, that, that little boy is you, right? Um, and he says, just all the things he says, you know, mom say femme combattant, like the way he talks about his mother, you know, I had to show my kids like, this is how you should talk about me, but I'm not a medal <laughs> um, And so that was really beautiful. And then similarly hearing from my dad, like, yes, absolutely. And that's how he felt about his mother. But what really struck me, and I think I paid more attention to, I wasn't like paying as close attention to the story, you know, to everything that was happening in the film. And so I was just kind of taking in the images and the sounds. The music really struck me this time. Um, and it's just so good. Like, it's just so beautiful. And someone actually in one of these like Haitian Facebook groups that I'm on, a woman asked, where, where does the music come from? And I would ask you, Itana, please like put on a Manon Sarah playlist or something on, on Spotify for the people because it's so beautiful. The music was so important to, to us. I think one of the first conversations I had with Itana, one of like the first things I was like, okay, well, what are we gonna do with music? Just because <laughs> for me, that's like how I edit. Um, and because he had a relationship with Ram, we were able to use mostly only Ram music on there, except for one Emmy Michelle song um, in the, the scene with um, her son, the mama, messy mama song. Um, but I, 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 I was so honored to be able to use uh, Luni's Moss and you know the Moss family's uh, legacy on this project and there it just scored it so perfectly it brought everything to life to like a whole other level um so that was really fun for me yeah I, uh, Keith, I mean thank you so much if you if you guys watching from Haiti right now Richard and and uh thank you so much for the music i think I, I think it's it's for me it's uh it's 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 i love the music and i can keep on listening to it, listening every single every single day but i, I mean what i when i was making the film doing some doing part of that time i i, I was living at the olofsen hotel so i had a lot of you know time chatting with them and they were like you know kind enough to let me use the the, the music so i can't wait to uh, host a screening very soon at the Lofton Hotel, very very soon. So, if you if you're in Haiti and then you 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 want to see Manasara, stay tuned because we will have a, a, a screening at the Lofton Hotel very soon. Great. I just want to, I'm reading through some of these questions. Uh, I wanted to let you know, Regine, that Jacqueline Jean-Baptiste says, it's really nice to see you. Um, she, this is going to lead us to a question about locality here in a moment. She says, I grew up in a part of my youth with your dad. I went to Haiti and I went to visit your mom and dad. At, I was at Lucia's funerals. Mon Rami was a great friend of my dad and now both are gone. My name is Jacqueline Jean-Baptiste. I live in Toronto. So she's saying hello. Um, but I would also love to get this question to get to get down to the details of locality here. Where has the film been screened? Has it only been screened in Port-au-Prince? And um, if so, where where are you planning to expand out from there? And how is that helping to build local or how are you thinking through the building of local relationships at these markets that you're planning? Because I just think that's such a fantastic piece of your project right now is getting these screenings done in the marketplace. I'd love for you to talk about that. Um, we we. We we having this event is part of the Muamas Muamas uh, Nosa we having for for March, um, and we 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 started in in Cap in Cap um, um, the other day on Friday. Um, we will have a uh, many many more screening. We screen in Port-au-Prince and in in in, uh, in Delma, which is near Port-au-Prince. Um, we haven't um, going um, screened the film in 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 a lot of places outside of Port-au-Prince because of obvious reason, COVID and, and, and security. But we have we are working very, very hard and we have a lot of, uh, we are very happy to have a lot of demand and a lot of people want to collaborate with us to screen the film. Um, we're currently uh, working with like, you know, um, dozens of, of feminist organization in Haiti to be able to take the, the film to, to people. So follow Madame Sarah, 
um, um, visit our website because we we will have many many more screenings for for you know for people in Haiti in the coming weeks days. Um, but all you get, but the the other thing you can do is also support the film because we try to raise some money to um, host free screening in Haiti for people. So you can go to our website. You can donate if you can. And also the other thing you can do is if you, you can tr help hosting a screening um, to make sure that more and more people can see can see the film. A lot of people were asking about that, about how to get more involved. So I'll just say that that's, that's one answer that we have, which is to support the Matin Midi Soi productions in bringing the, this film and the conversation, the debate to marketplaces across Haiti. There are people also asking if there's any way that Fond Crozé, if they could support Fond Crozé setting up a special fund for Madame Saga. And then relatedly, just asking about the kinds of organization that exists at the local level for Madan Sara, if they are organized in any way, if women come together, for example, I would say in a given marketplace, if the, the Madan Sara of that marketplace are, are organized in any informal way. Um, I think they're organized in, in many informal ways. Um, and also if someone really wants to help, you can support, um, you know, you can support some financial institution, you can also support um, many feminist organizations in Haiti was 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 working with with women. There there are there are many ways you can you can you can you can support uh, the Manasa. Um, yeah, if, if you want to support Fon Jose, yes, you can support Fon Jose. They they I, they they are mostly I think mostly um, mostly um, microfinance institution. That's the, that's the one who works with Manasa in Haiti. Um, it's 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 in any ways possible so you can help that 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 can that can uh, do a change a lot of things Spe spe specifically if you can support organization that's working with manasa but in some cases it's it's family organization in some other cases it's, it's it can be some financial institution Right. Um, I I just want to say we're planning on going for another t eight minutes, I guess, and then we can end at uh, right at um, the 50 minute mark, if that's all right with everyone. Uh, we have tons of questions. So I also want to say that we'll be like I said, we'll have a recording of the discussion up and I can send that out to the to the um, panelists as well, but I'll also be happy to forward the, the questions along that don't get answered in case panelists want to take time to respond to those. Um, I have a question about the burning of the market, which has come up in several of these questions that are showing up. I'm just wondering if you can speak a bit about that. I feel like each of you could offer a different perspective on it. The questions that come to me are first, Clearly, um, you and a drone operator were there when when the Machan de Fe burned down. There's footage directly from that. Um, so I'm interested in the Madan Sarat team's take on that. But also for Regine, who's worked so much on violence against bodies, I'm just wondering how you how you connect this, how you see through this and think through this, um, and are able to like what kind of resilience are you finding in the in the sort of film that Atant made, but also the other possibilities for speaking back to this kind of violence, um, such as the way that discussions are getting opened up. I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just gonna leave that really open to how you want to, to think through that. I feel like that really connects with your work. Should I go first? Um, I was thinking that you all would go first. So yes, thank you for that question. I think, yeah, I, I think about these, you know, forms of violence against women and especially, you know, Haitian women, well, especially black women and Haitian women, obviously, specifically. Um, and that the ways that this is to me also just this confluence of the state violence, which I think they really capture very well in the film, that this is structural violence as well, right? It's this intersection. Um, of the structural violence that is so gendered, right? Um, and meted out, you know, against women. And they talk about the fact that many of the, you know, that, that the Meadow Sara also are, are, are rape survivors, right? Um, and so I think that what the film helps to do is again, to amplify and nuance, right? Which is like why I love this film so much is that, so it amplifies, if you didn't know the stories about the fire, the fires in the Mashe, like now you know, right? Um, and, 
there and so it, it amplifies it but then it also kind of nuances it because it asks you to think about like well why is this happening and why you know I love that thing about the like the fire um the the coming from Delma and the fire trucks right and so just why is this happening and why is there no support so it's kind of a another perspective on the state's abandonment of the people but that is again gendered um, and that amplifies the, the many forms of violence that um, women are subject to. And also though, without, and this is a, you know, a thing that I think about a lot is like not framing Haitian women as these eternal victims, right? But also not framing them as these eternal warriors who are only resilient and nothing else. And so I think that one thing that it uh, you know, captures beautifully is that the women, like you see these women screaming, crying, right? The, that woman says, you know, we don't, we don't want justice. We, we don't want peace. We want justice. And so there's also this resistance and their ability to identify it, right? And they say, it's like, we under, this is, this is a pattern, right? Is what they're saying. They're not like, oh, Oh, jab no man, like, oh, no, they're like, this is wrong. This is an injustice and this is a pattern. So they're willing to call it out, which I think is also an important manifestation of their resistance. If my memory is good, is correct. I think the market burning is the first uh, sequence, first scenes that we talk about, right, Luniz? I think this is one of the first thing like we, we talk about in terms of like, I, I wanted to like, one of the things that I was looking for is like visually, what is the best way to, you know, to have the audience face, you know, th this reality, especially, you know, people in Haiti, like it's um, when I'm talking about, because I wanted to like, for people to like, to see it, to like, you know, um, and I, and, and, uh, and Tina put it together beautifully and um, I'm very happy and, and the, all the feedback so far, People are asking a lot of questions, a lot of comments, a lot of a lot of debates about it, and and this is what you know I I I was looking for um, when I was thinking about it, and what we ended up doing is is actually um, um, working. I don't I don't have a, I don't have you know a, a solution right now, but I think it's 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 how to stop the fires, but I think uh, the debate is is out there right now, and we we must do something about it. Yeah, I think I think that the fires are the most like clear articulation of the danger and the neglect that these women face. Like if there's like one thing that you can pinpoint, like point at and say, look how these women are in danger, the fire is like like the 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 most concrete way that you can show it. And like it uh, it done spent years just going every time there was a fire, going and documenting and documenting that there was so much footage and so many interviews. That we like that we sifted through, and it's the only part in the documentary where we get interviews from um, Mashans who aren't necessarily Marasala, just people you know who are involved in the marketplace. And I, it, was, it was kind of important for us to just kind of linger like in that space and like let them be heard because no one, it's not really about hearing from a specialist, although we do have someone from Aaron Didash who, who, who speaks to, you know, what the phenomenon is and where it's coming from. But it was really important to just let the people in the Mashi scream and like express their pain. Um, and it was also important that, that that moment didn't come you know, in a way that that then it became just like a traumatic piece, you know, because we knew that that sequence was going to be a really big part of the film and we wanted to build to it, but we didn't, we did also didn't want to just stay there like, oh, these women are, you know, it's burning their victims, you know, and then it's over, you know? So like, there was a lot of care um, on Ethan's part and, you know, on how we put it together on how to, how to, how to present this problem how to show it, how to allow you to feel it, but how to not make it that that is their entire story because in no, in no stretch of the imagination are these women simply victims. But we also, it is important for you to realize that there's a problem here. It is dire, it is life-threatening, it is urgent um, and it needs to be dealt with immediately uh, because they deserve better. And I feel that we maybe achieved our goal. <laughs> so I'm quite happy with them. You definitely did. You did. 
we're getting definite agreement in the chat as well. I think you beautifully held the, I, I think there's this one line that really sticks with me in the film, especially the second time that, that I'm hearing it, which is um, not a line actually that Amadan Sara says, it's the economist I believe was reflecting. And he says, um, uh, he's speaking about the debt that's owed to the Madan Saga, how, how people, and, and I extend this to all of us really, uh, especially on International Women's Day, but the debt that's owed to these, to the extraordinary, to these extraordinary women who work, who work tirelessly, who, um, who are capable of resilience and strength, but who also can be shown in these moments of vulnerability. And I, I think about the way that the film itself repays part of that debt. Obviously, it's not all of it. It's the opening of a conversation. But there's a way in which crafting this story in such a caring way, um, how, how that is really working in terms of amplifying their narrative, but how, how that pays the debt. I'm just wondering if there's other debts, just the closing answer that I'm gonna have because debt is coming up a lot in this question and answer session, which is how can people pay their debt? How can the international community repay the debt now that um, it's incurred? Um, how can it how can it help amplify or you know assist the situation and then locally people in the diaspora, but also you guys, I'd love to hear you guys reflect on, on what it means to, um, to owe a debt, if that's how you consider it, or or what you think about debt in general and and societal debt in the case of um, of what the Madan Sara have been through and and their marginalization and their continued efforts to um, to uplift themselves in their communities. So I'm always like, why am I always going first? Um, I'm like, you all, it's your film. <laughs> um, I, you know, the language of debt to me, it's just so capitalist, right? And I think about the ways in which the film is so not cap, or at least the Madan Saga, and I think the film um, is not. Um, I, I've, I've been, you know, we're, we're trying to get, do host a screening at, at, even at my institution at Boston College. And I'm like, it's all, tell me how much you want from the honorarium. He's like, just like support the film, you know? And so the, the, I, I'm trying to, I wanna reframe that idea of debt. Um, and I think that's something that is more, you know, I think that we always, especially as people that work on IET and that love IET and think about IET and create, you know, art and scholarship and all things literature related to IET that we can always find our inspiration from our culture, right? So I think the idea of like, right? Like homage to me is more um, kind of important or not important, but it's how I wanna reframe that in terms of debt. So the question then becomes like, how do we honor the Madan Saga, right? How do we honor whether those are the Madan Saga who are part of our ancestors who have now gone on to be um, in the ancestral realm or is it the Madan Saga that are their lived experience right now are in IT right now in the current context that we're in, in the political crisis that we're in. Um, or the women that we see in this film, right? Like just, you know, as, as Eta and Nunez were telling us, so how do we continue to honor them? I think is how I would, would reframe the question. And now that I've reframed it, I'll leave it to Eta and Nunez to answer it. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, uh, I'm trying to pay my debt by not talking too much. And first of all, that's, that's all. <laughs> this is a good start. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, I agree with Regine. And I think uh, in some cases, I would say uh, there are many things that, that we can do. And maybe we need to take, to take less or do less damage the, the, the um, to, um, to half of the country. Um, and uh, because like, like Kami men mentioned in the film, like we don't have to go to the other side of the country. The country doesn't have to develop to valorize the work of the women. Um, I think, I think um, it's, thanks God, um, Regine and, and Lunis, they are not here asking for revenge, they're just asking for respect, which is like pretty basic. Uh, I think we can do better as like, uh, as, a, as a society, as men, we must do better. And this is how we will honor uh, Marasa and Haitian women in general. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree with what both of you said. I mean, as far as paying the debt, if we were to attempt to, yeah, it's, it's not even a, a, I don't know that it's possible to pay the debt 
that we have to the Marasaga. Um, but at least, at the very least, uh, providing them with the bare minimum so that they can do what they're trying to do would be a start. Um, for me personally, I, I feel very much like this project was um, a way to honor them. And I, and I feel like it's a beautiful, be a beautiful beginning to trying to you know, honor, to pay a debt. Um, but I don't think that it's uh, a debt that will ever be cleared. That's not including in the, the, the friends that that not included. So we need that money back. Okay. I just want to be clear on that one. Just living, I think living with indebtedness, um, and, and with rethinking indebtedness and with rethinking debt. Now, I think that's a good place to, to let it hang. Thank you guys so, so much for, for joining us. Um, I just want to thank each of you, Regine, Etan, Luniz, for, for coming, um, Deborah, and for Chris for making this possible, Deborah for opening, um, and Tim for assisting here. We will have the video recording up as soon as possible, and we'll be sharing it with you. And again, if you're interested in supporting free market screenings of the Madansara film in Haiti, you can go to the link that was shared in the chat. And I want to remind you again that we also have another event in English and Haitian Creole dealing with women rights and activism in the month of March, which you can find on our website at www.cepen.org. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us for this wonderful screening. Um, the attendance was phenomenal. And I know you're going to have so much success going forward in your Haitian um, screenings, as well as the other ones you have coming up in the virtual sphere. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for the film. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. Yes. Thank Bye. You. Thanks. Thank you so much for coming in.